I'm a firm believer that it's better to do something in a shitty way than not, than not doing anything, like waiting for, you know, the right moment or the right technique or like, you know, whatever. It happened to me so many times that I modeled things and then looking at those like a few months after, I was like, well, I should have done it the other way. Well, that's good. Next time you're gonna do it like the proper way. Alessandro is a prolific character artist that has worked at some of the top studios in the world. Uh, he spent eight years at Blur Studios creating high-end characters for their ridiculously good-looking game trailers. Uh, then he spent three years at Riot Games working on League of Legends and most recently The Mill on various VFX projects. He's unquestionably one of the top character artists working in the industry today which you can immediately see when you browse his portfolio. It's just insane, uh, the level of work he's able to consistently produce. Uh, so in this interview that you're about to hear, he gives away vital knowledge specifically for those of you that are self learners and are looking for ways that you can improve how you learn. So in the interview, he talks about why you shouldn't be scared of learning new software, uh, what tasks in the 3D industry he thinks will be automated within the next five to 10 years, how he got his first job, uh, why doing something badly now is better than waiting for the right knowledge, why some artists shoot themselves in the foot by focusing too much on the technical, and why you should be utilizing asset libraries in your work. And speaking of asset libraries, this video is sponsored by our sister company, Polygon a library of textures that include all the maps you need for photorealistic materials. They work in any 3D software and there are thousands to choose from. So with Polygon, you can create bigger and better environments, architecture, characters, you name it. So sign up for a free account with the link in the description um, and try out some of our free materials. There's no downsides that I can see. So now sit back and enjoy this in-depth discussion with the expert character artist, Alessandro Baldassaroni. Alessandro, why don't we start at the beginning? How did you find your start in 3D? Um, let's put it this way. Um, I never really like uh, attended like artistic studies um, when, I was, uh, when I was younger. So one of my biggest regret was to not learn yeah, you know, to draw basically. Uh, I studied like uh, science of information, and so um, and then like I found a job basically in um, you know um, computer engineering company, and uh, a coworker of mine basically gave me uh, a copy back in the days. We're talking about 1997 of uh, 3D Max. Yeah. And, uh, and that's how I started. I started like a, a completely like hobbyist, basically. I was doing like a um, CAD job during the day. And then when I was going back home, I was practicing with, uh, with 3 Studio Max. And it was intoxicating. I was having so much fun just like doing simple objects in 3D, like a Christmas tree or like, uh, you know, a uh, table with like glasses mm -hmm. or an ashtray and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, at the time, we're talking about 1996, 1998, CG was kind of like pioneeristic in a way to make like, uh, you know, kind of like nice renders. Mm -hmm. And uh, every day was a different discovery. And that's, that's how I started, just like playing with the software. So an engineer gave you yeah, a first just copy like of a 3D Max. Worker of mine. Um, okay. He, he noticed that I was doing some, uh, uh, you know, rudimental 3D stuff with the um, limited at the time like possibilities of uh, AutoCAD uh, 14, and I was like, why don't you try something, something like this? You know, why don't you try 3D Studio, 3D Studio 1.0, okay. which is more like oriented to, um, you know, 3D rendering. Yeah. Um, and I start practicing by myself, yeah. you know. Yeah. And do you recall uh, what it was specifically about it that that you that drew you to it? Uh, I think I start playing with like some primitives, and okay. I was like, and I was clicking render, 
you know, placing a light and stuff like that. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I was uh-huh. moving around like lights in the, in the viewport and I was seeing, I know that it sounds stupid, <laughs> I mean, compared to what people can do today, sure. we can do today. Yeah. But at the time it was, it was simply, it was simply amazing. It was just like mesmerizing to see like, you know, that a software was actually giving you the possibility to do something visual in a matter of like seconds, yeah. even if it was like, simple you know yeah. because I remember that at the time the only way to achieve something like that was to actually either use photoshop or to actually draw it you know? right, yeah by hand um, but in a second you could have like a fully rendered like you know sphere with shadows and uh, and it was a very impressive at the time mm. you know it and sounds funny today but at the time it was like the kind of thing that uh, in the mind of like a young uh, a young guy was actually having an effect you know what I mean so and did you it was the wonder of a software. It was like almost like magical, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Yeah. Today maybe something something like that could be comparable to, you know, a plugin that makes like amazing things that has never been seen before. Yeah. And that's the kind of like feeling that I had at the time, like the feeling of like discovering a new world of like possibilities. Right. Especially for a guy that always wanted to um, to do like artistic stuff. I was good at drawing when I was a kid, yeah. but then when I grew up, I didn't like follow my, uh, my passion. I got into like science of information to become a programmer, but that interest always stayed in the back of my head to make like uh, visuals, like, you know, um, images. Mm. Do, you, do you recall a time when you realized that this was something that you could do professionally? Yeah, there was a time in particular, I was in this company and you know we were making like electric uh, wirings and stuff like that and uh, my boss was so nice that uh, he was allowing me to use this software like this 3d studio software at uh, at work you know in the um, in between project basically let's put it this way and i made an image it was like a it was just like a vehicle like you know running um, on a on a truck or something like that and i posted on a website called uh, 3d cafe and they gave me an award. It was like, it was mind blowing. I was so excited. I mean, 3D Cafe, I don't know if it's still there, but at the time it was like one of the few point of reference okay. for people interested in this like very niche wow. kind of like. Um, so that was before CG yeah. Society? Oh yeah, yeah. It was, wow. I know, I'm not sure it was before, maybe it was contemporary at some yeah. point. But yeah, it was one of the few there in this like limbo of uh, you know um, internet computer graphic resources so they gave me an award and i was like oh my god maybe maybe i can make it make a living out of it uh, the problem was that was that there was not not much to do in a in a country like italy at the time there was not like a solid uh, industry so i started looking around and i figured out that there was like a game company called uh, called milestone and they're still there they still uh, uh, develop triple uh, a racing games and then at some point i submitted a, a portfolio just made of like very simple images made in 3 studio max 1.0 yeah. and i got an email back saying that they were interested and i completed a switch career at that point i was you know it was just like jumping in a black hole of like uncertainty because working in video games at that era i'm talking about at this point like early early 2000 mm-hmm. was completely uncertain mm-hmm. it was like i don't know i mean i don't know what's gonna happen i don't know if i'm gonna have a job in like three months from now and i was coming from a very good like uh, uh full-time position in that company you know yeah. so to me it was like literally Follow what you like to do and try it, you know. Yeah. Um, nice. Why not? And so, so you found this hub of people online. Um, and how did, you, how did you learn? How did you learn how to do it without schooling? Or? I, I learned by myself, just like practicing, practicing with the software. My goal was always like, hey, I have something that I want to do, like a, like a sword, like a piece of a, an object coming from a comic or a movie or whatever, and uh, I need the tool to do it. The tool is my software, which at the time was like 3 Studio Max. So there was no ZBrush, no other like, you know, um, other like additional software or anything like that. 
they were just like you in the software, and you need to find you, you had to find out like techniques to actually make like simple things like these objects, you know. Yeah. And there was nothing online either. I mean, there was not much at all, to be honest. There were like a few tutorials written by some, uh, uh, some very passionate people, yeah. but that's it. So most of the time, you were just like you and the software. You were just like endless uh, trying and trying and like, you know, learn from your own mistakes, spending hours just to do maybe like a stupid like chain revolving around the spline. And sometimes you had to figure out how even how to do it because it wasn't obvious at all. Mm -hmm just like, you know, opening the software, you're like, I don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And today it sounds ridiculous, but at the time you had to, you know, to go, to go on like um, online and look for tutorials, how to bend the chain along a spline, you know what I mean? Even today it's like that. But at the time you were lucky if you could, you, if you could find something like that, because sometimes like nothing. Right, know, yeah. Just figure it out, you know? Um, yeah, it was very, it was very limited in terms of like resources that you could find. But you know, in a way, it was good because it was pushing yourself to actually try things, you know, um, to be like uh, flexible when it comes to the software, to understand like the tools that they're using to a deeper level, probably, you know, uh, to just play, to just play and and be and be fascinated by, by what you can achieve. Sometimes you could, you could achieve something just by just by mistake, and you were like, oh my god, this is so so interesting. It was opening new possibilities, you know what I mean? What, what do you think it was in you to become a tinkerer? Somebody that would, would be prepared to fail continuously in, uh, in software, um, compared to, to some people who, who can't see a way to, to, to do something themselves. They, they need the tutorial. What was it that... Uh, that it, was the fa it was the fact that it was not, nobody to help me. I mean, I knew that there were like people interested in the same things that I was interested, like computer graphic, yeah. but it was very hard to reach them, you know what I mean? Um, so I, I had to do it by myself. I had to like spending literally hours and hours in my spare time, you know? Some people in Italy, they were maybe like, I don't know, playing video games. I was playing video games too, but I was dedicating a lot of time to computer graphic. Mm -hmm. Or they were like hobbies like soccer. I was a nerd at the time, you know, I'm not afraid to, <laughs> to say it. <laughs> so I was spending so much time in front of the computer doing these kind of things. Yeah. And uh, the, w the thing is like, to me, the goal was to make images. Mm -hmm. So there was no like side thinking of like, I wanna make a living, I wanna make money with this because there was no possibility anyway, you know. It, so it was about like, it's fun, I want to make something visual. Everything was oriented to that. So it, it was the purest kind of like um, feeling when it comes like to, to create things, you know what I mean? There was no side, uh, side goal, like no, no economic benefits, no nothing, it was just fun. Yeah. I think that was the main drive that actually push me to keep trying and trying and trying. Despite the fact that I was doing shitty things, you know, I mean, what I was doing was like ridiculous, but for me it was everything. For me it was like, I was so proud. I was showing this like, uh, I don't know, these ashtrays to my, to my friends and they were like, wow, this is, they were like, wow, this is fascinating. Because they, they had no idea how that was done. Right. It, was, it was that pioneeristic, that was, it was that like um, innovative at the time, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Today, everybody's like somehow exposed to the fact that everything they see in like movies, especially like, you know, blockbuster, is somehow done with the computers, you know? So people have no sense of wonder anymore, except of like amazing executions, you know? But back in the days, people, they, they didn't even, even know that you can do that, you know, with a computer and a software, you know what I mean? Yeah, right. They were like, how is this done? It's like a photo. Some people were saying, is this a photo? Nobody would say that, that the, the crappy things I was doing at the time, they were like photorealistic. But back in the days, people were like, wow, this is weird. What am I looking at? You yeah, know right. Mean? The idea of like computer generated images was still something, was still like a novelty at yeah. the time, you know, yeah. in like late, uh, late 90s, let's right. put it this way, you know. Yeah. I mean, we had movies like, you know, Tron and the, the visual effects industry was were was slowly like creeping into the uh, the VFX plus blockbusters, but it was not like uh, in the general mind of people that you know uh, 
you can do the kind of stuff like you know with, in computer graphic. Mm, right. So yeah. So do you remember uh, the first time you you were your your first paid gig related to 3D, the first time someone gave you money to do something in 3D? Oh, well, yes, it's, it coinc coincides when, when, uh, when I started working for, um, for that game company, uh, Milestone in Milan, when I had like regular paychecks. I was a generalist at the time, so I was doing um, um, basically either like tracks, racing tracks or, or vehicles. Vehicles. Yeah, okay. vehicles. So yeah. I had like regular paychecks and I was, I was feeling amazing. I was like, wow, I can't believe somebody pays me to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to do these kind of things that, you know, um, yeah. It wasn't a regular job at all. At it time. wasn't? No, not at all. So it was a casual... No, 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 I'm saying like it wasn't like a normal, sorry, it wasn't a normal job at all. It wasn't a common job sure. at the time. It was very, very specific, very um, high tech in a way, you know. People were basically saying, I mean, maybe they still say that today to people that work in video game. They say, oh, so you play games all day. That's what they were telling me. Or they were saying like, oh, when are you gonna give me like copies of like whatever game? I was like, no, oh, I mean, I, I do 3D, I'm an artist. I, right. I mean, saying that you were an artist at the time in Italy was ridiculous. So nobody, nobody were ever like in my position saying that. Hmm. That came later, you know. Right. They were just saying, oh, I work in this company, you know, we do, we do video games. Yeah. But you couldn't really be too specific because people would never understand. You yeah, know I mean? right. In my dream was at some point to work on something like that, like one of those like products, one of those like cinematics with those people. So yeah, but it was like always in the back of my head. It was nothing really, it was abstract, an abstract like thought. It wasn't really, you know, uh, I didn't really have the drive to be like, how can I move myself to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. What happened likely is just, I've been lucky, let's put it this way, because- <laughs> You got, got lucky. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was, all, 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 my, all my career has basically been on a rail somehow, because to me it was always like fun to do these things. Mm -hmm. And then I started posting these things online, and I got, and I got a lot of like recognition online, first by users. And then I realized that a lot of like recruiters were also like going online to like forums and portals to actually um, look for people to hire. Yeah. And that's, and it was really like the, the online popularity that at some point got me some, uh, some contacts with like people and company outside of Italy. And these people start asking me to freelance mainly, you know, and that made me realize that it was like a broader industry outside, you know, there was like a bigger picture, like a bigger war when it comes like to, to computer graphic. And maybe it wasn't that hard to actually do what I really wanted to do, like high quality stuff of the caliber of those like uh, Blizzard cinematics, basically, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I started getting like some, some offers in terms of like freelancing. And then... Uh, Wait, who is that from? Uh, it was like, Different companies like Guerrilla Games, flagship, flagship Studio, um, next like it was Blur, you know. Um, yeah, tell me about Blur. Yeah, bl Blur, bl Blur basically came to a point, to, to a time when like, I was doing a lot of like personal work. So I was working in this like video game company, doing like tr vehicles or trucks, but nothing really related to characters when it comes like to my daily job, but on the side, in my spare time, I was always like trying to push my true passion, which was basically like making high-end CG. And most of the subjects were like characters, mostly, mm. you know. I was posting them online, and then one day I got contacted by, by Blur Studio that noticed some stuff that I posted on like, it probably, probably was like CG Talk at the time, okay. which is the actual CG society. And uh, they were like, well, we like your stuff online, and uh, we were wondering, we, w we are wondering if you would be interested in like um, doing some freelance work for us. And that's how I started. Um, I started like freelancing for, for Blur and, uh, and it was a lot of fun. I was freelancing for them and I was, at the same time I had like a daily job at this game company. So I was basically working for Blur um, after my working hours, after like 6 p.m. and like keep going till like uh, early hours in the morning of the next day, you know, it was, it was, it was that intoxicating, you know. <laughs> the funny thing is that the, the job that actually 
Blur wanted me to do was much more fun than my actual job that I had like, you know, uh, in the, during the day. So that was my drive. That was like, oh my God, this American company, which already, even at the time, they were doing amazing stuff in terms of like cinematics, you know. Right. Is asking me to be a part of it, and I can't really say no. Even so, if even my body's tired, it was it was that fun. It was that intoxicating to keep pushing me to to do it. You know. How long did you continue that that freelance? I think I freelanced for them for about I don't know, maybe like one year and a half, mm -hmm. and then at some point it happened that um, probably some people left at Blur, um, some characters modelers. So Blur asked me if I was interested um, in a full time position. Um, at their studio, so right. they asked me if I was interested to to relocate. And honestly, at the time, I didn't really have any strong bounds with with my you know with Italy except my except my family. And um, I told about it, and uh, and I accepted. There was the problem of the visa, of course, because uh, uh, you know you need to have a, a working permit. So it took a while for Blur to to figure out the right kind of visa for, for people like me. Mm -hmm. And then when the papers were ready, I basically moved to, to Venice to, to Blur in uh, October 2007. Can you describe how it felt walking through the Blur doors for the first time? Oh, it was amazing. It was just like, it was unbelievable because I knew, the, I knew some people that they were, they were already working there for a while through like, you know, online popularity. And seeing so many talent like condensed in the same place to me was like incredible. It was uh, it was humbling. It was like fascinating. It was like uh, I don't know. <laughs> it was very hard to describe what it means for somebody coming from a from a, from a country like Italy, where like the industry is very like it was very like underdeveloped yeah. to a place like that and be part of such a such a reality. You know what I mean? Is there much of an industry in Italy nowadays? It's it's a little bit better. There are like, I mean, there are a few more companies that actually you can choose if you want to like, you know, work in computer graphics. So it's definitely better right. compared to 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. But I can't really tell that there is like a flourishing, a flourishing like computer graphic industry. Right. I mean, anyway, nothing comparable to what you can find here in, uh, uh, in Los Angeles and the surroundings, you know yeah. what I mean? Or the United States in general, you know? So for me, it was a, an amazing opportunity. It was like, okay, I mean, just, there's not much more than this for now, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And it was fun. It was definitely lots and lots of fun, at least at the beginning. <laughs> so, so Blur was basically sold on you, so they didn't really have to do an interview or anything like that because they already knew you were good. Well, no, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, at the time when I, when I stepped into Blur for the first time, I had already probably like a solid you know, almost two years of freelancing of experience with them. Okay. So they knew what I could deliver. But to be honest, like, there was still a lot to prove because when you work as a freelancer for Blur mm. from abroad, it's not exactly like the same thing of like being in-house. There is a lot of like technical things and like processes that you don't really see working as a freelancer. That, that I realized they were like extremely important and valuable, you know, when you're actually an employee, you know what I mean? Um, so I wasn't really seeing how the sausages were really made when I was in, uh, when I was in Italy. Mm -hmm. And my working experience when I came to Blur after as an employee was way more like complete and enriched compared to when I was a, was a freelancer. When I was a freelancer, I was only caring about making something great, like visually, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But the, the technical side of it for me was kind of like nebulous. Mm -hmm. And that was because like a lot of people were taking my model that, was, that I was uploading on FTP and actually polishing it, correcting the bugs, uh, correcting like a lot of things, making like workable for their pipeline. So I wasn't aware of that process, which is huge, which is actually huge. It's maybe like a good like 40% of the actual times, you know what I mean? So other people were actually doing it. And I thought I was badass, but I wasn't. I mean, I was like doing an okay job, you know, when I was in Italy, but then I realized, wow, that guy fixed that stuff. Oh, wow, that guy, like, made this, like, workable, animatable, riggable, whatever, you know. So when I came to Blur, I realized that I was just, like, hitting, not the tip of the iceberg, but I wasn't really, like, aware of what was really going on in terms of, like, pipeline and, uh, 
and character modeling process when I was just like freelancing, you know. Right. How did it feel working amongst uh, so many artists that are way up there in oh, it skill? Was, it, was, it, was, uh, <laughs> it was intimidating at times, you know yeah. what I mean? Because sometimes like, I knew a lot of people through online popularities, but there were other people that were completely unknown to me. And then I slowly learned that there was people who were like legends and they were like so good and so experienced and so like calm even in like stressful situations, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, that was an aspect that for me was completely, you know, unaware. Mm -hmm. I was only taking care of like doing things that were like pleasantly looking, but there was totally another aspect when it comes like to commitment, to endurance, to like, um, you know, uh, relationship with coworkers, you know, yeah. doing your same job. That for me was completely unknown. And these people to me, they are being teachers in a way, they have been like inspirations, you know what I mean? Yeah. Not to mention people that actually gave me a lot, in, even in terms of like uh, artistic knowledge and, uh, you know, um, and told me how to look at things, how to observe things, how to be, how to not fall in love with the first thing that I've done, but like keep iterating, right. you know what I mean? Um, the value of like doing paint overs, you know what I mean? That's right. that's something that I learned at Blur. Explain that. What's what do you mean paint overs? Well, like before, I was basically modeling modeling things, but uh, based on like references. But Blur basically told me the importance of like for people like me to execute really properly a given a given concept. So usually, what happens is that we start with a concept, right? And then we do the three D model. How do, you com how do you judge when the 3D model is like, you know, good enough? Basically, you have to compare it with the, the two piece of a concept art, but somebody needs to do a paint over on your 3D, or basically you want to overlay the 3D on top of the concept artist and see the differences. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wasn't really like methodically doing that before going to Blur, but some people told me, hey, you know what? If you don't do this, probably you're not gonna go like move through the pipeline. That was the kind of place that Blur was. It wasn't about like, kind of like, you know, um, matching the concept. It was almost like religiously follow some direction in order to, you know, to accomplish a specific vision, you know what I mean? So, um, so you were taking other people's concepts and modeling them? Yeah, that, that's basically my job. I'm, a, I'm an executioner. I'm not like a, a concept artist. So I do, I do for production, uh, 3D models based on like concepts most of the time, but I don't really do design. Mm -hmm. But even there, even if it sounds like somehow like limited, there is a lot of things that you need to um, to take care of, which is the likeness to a given concept. And by likeness, sometimes I mean like, hey, the concept is in 2D. You have to do your best to actually translate it in, th in 3D to the point that sometimes when you trace your render on top of it, it almost matches. That was the kind of place that like Blur was at the time. They were so religious about the concept and what they like in the 2D, and they really wanted it to tra translate it into 3D in the best possible way. So paint towers were like done like a lot of times, like, you know, and, uh, and some people were really knowledgeable about it. And I learned a lot through, through that, like through observation, through um, the errors that I was making, you know, the importance of like collecting like references to really like train your eyes to a certain like um, sensibility when it comes like to matching like forms and silhouettes and stuff like that, you know. And this is just what you learned being around other artists that were yeah artists, you, artists yeah. and like supervisors, right. artists and supervisors. Because yeah. the bar, the bar in character modeling at the time it was so high. Because like the people around me, my coworkers, they were doing specifically my same job like character modeling. They were so good that uh, you really didn't want to, you know, to deliver something in the pipeline that wasn't that wasn't really standing there in that like threshold of like uh, good quality. You know what I mean? So we, we were basically like inspiring each other. Right. It's not that we were like giving feedbacks to each other every day because the only feedback we were having was from the coworkers. But maybe you were looking at the characters done by another guy. And you were like, oh my God, how did you make such a great like sculpting or such a great uh, metal shader or, you know, 
and you were going to talk with this guy, and he was sharing his experience willingly, you know. Yeah. And that was that was simply amazing. That was to me, it was like, wow, this is such a huge vault of like valuable information that I can just like reach anytime, like so easily, you know, at the the distance of like few days, there's this guy that can just like share his stuff with me, you know. Mm-hmm. And before that, I was just like, you know, working in my room in Italy with nobody else to talk with except like online guys, you know, doing my same job, my same like, not, not my same job, but having my same uh, passion, you know. So at that point it was like, oh my God, I have so much like things that I can like learn from people around me. A- and also the fact that they were amazing, honestly, you know, Blur was not, hiring people that they were not like exceptionally good right yeah it was they always had like uh, um you know their policy has always been like quality first and then like we don't really care where where you come from you know your nationality your education as long as your portfolio is great mm. you can find a place here and uh, i've noticed and you were feeling proud that. of it you were feeling really proud of like being part of such a elite Let's put it this way, you know. Yeah. Like they, 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 they basically at the time they did have like no, no interns, no. There was no place to. I mean, there was no uh, chance to be trained in blur. If they hire you, it's because like you're already good st- from the start. Mm. You know what I mean? So wow. They, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, in 2007, they were no. Not even now, I think. Like they, they were not basically accepting people with the idea that they maybe will they will grow in the company, like junior. If they were hiring you, they were good. That's it. You know. So I mean? Blur doesn't hire juniors. Maybe, maybe this day, this day they do. I've been missing like Blur for the past two years, so maybe they have like you know some junior. I'm not sure to be honest. Like, but at the time it was very, it was very direct. It was very like, hey, you just sit at your desk, do your things. You have to be autonomous. You, I mean, you can't ask people like how to do things. Because there is no time. It's not. It's not because people would be like, no. I mean, I'm sorry. I can't tell you. You should know it. It's just because there is no time. The the schedules were so tight. Okay. The turnaround of like character was like so incredibly tight at the time that you better know how to do it in a fast way, and without relying on other people. You know what right. I mean? Right. And the quality need to be high. So it was very. It was very <laughs> hardcore. You know what I mean? But yeah. hey, I, it's got to be perfect. At the time, I already had like. <laughs> almost like two years of freelance with them. It was just a matter of like getting used to my new desk, <laughs> to my new amazing machine and stuff like that. But, you know. What do you, um, what do you attribute Blur's exceptionally high, because high, uh, you, you watch other, tra- like, because they do primarily video game trailers, for those who don't know who Blur Studio is, right? That's, that's their primary bread and butter is video it's game trailers. Big, it's a big part of their, of their business, but they do a lot of like, uh, commercials too. They do a lot of like. They do a lot like. They do a consistent part of visual effects as well, you know. So I mean, it's it's a it's a it's an animation studio right. at the end of the day, you know. And they at the time when I when I joined, they already had like an Oscar nominated like short film like um, um, Gopher Broke, and they were doing their internal like short uh, short films. It's an anim- it's it's an amazing studio to be right. honest when yeah, it comes yeah. like to. Um, what they can create in a very short amount of time with a very high quality, you know what I mean? And through the years, they diversify their, their business model somehow. But yes, at the core, they do a lot of like game cinematics, of course, even today. Yeah. What, if you had to, I don't know, so, so Blur was, say, in LA, was it one of the top studios? Like Pixar, I guess, is always the top. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking, yeah, I, I wasn't really thinking that way. To me, it was like, I was so fond about as a gamer at the time about what they could deliver in terms yeah. of like game cinematics, right. my desire wasn't really about like being part of a movie or anything like that. Like that. To me it was about, hey, I want to do characters. Was it, I want to do this, the kind of character that they have in their cinematics. That kind of like complexity, you know what hmm. I mean? So, um, as a challenge? As a challenge, like, but also I like them. I just simply like them. I was, you know, I was into fantasy, I was into sci-fi. Uh, I still am, moderately, not as much as before, but yeah. at the time I was like, I mean, this is the best place ever. I mean, right. the variety, the variety of like project that they deal with is so big and uh, that I can't do so many characters. And the turnaround was so fast 
that in one year you could easily have like eight to ten characters in your portfolio. And they're all different. I mean, kind of like in the same ballpark of like fantasy, sci-fi, soldiers, whatever. But it wasn't boring at all. It wasn't boring at all. At least like the first the first years, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and also like the client uh, were basically giving us like either concept or very rough models to start with, just to have like a general idea of what they want to achieve. And uh, and our job was to make amazing things. And we were always like somehow impressing them and impressing our, our audience or you know the gamers too with the quality that we were delivering. Then through the years, like of course, like the, the game graphic in video games got better and better. So for us, it was getting a little bit like um, more difficult to have like a strong ownership when it comes to 3D models yeah. because we were already receiving like amazing 3D models from game companies. Yeah. And uh, when, when you get like an amazing sculpt from, uh, from a 3D company, you feel like, oh my God, my job is a little bit more like limited. I can still do like texturing and shading, but I can't have like full ownership on somebody that has already been like uh, amazingly modeled, you know what I mean? So going back, so you were, uh Young fella in Italy, found your way into LA, uh, working at Blur, and how long were you at Blur for? Uh, it was about like almost eight years. I left, uh, I left in uh, uh, May 2015. Yeah. Okay, and um, were you looking for a new channel? Where did you go? So what happened uh, after Blur? Basically like my, my arc in Blur, I started as like character modeler. Um, just like doing characters, and then pretty soon I start. Uh, they asked me to be to be lead lead character artist on projects, which meant basically like having a lot of like responsibilities in terms of like managing teams, and uh, and doing in a way less art because you had to manage people, you know, to direct people, to you know, to take their asset sometimes from people that you know they're not even in the studio like freelancer. Um, looking at them, putting in the pipeline. So a lot of like technical and like managing responsibilities um, that somehow I wasn't that interested into, you know, I was still doing it because I mean, I love working in that studio, yeah. but in the long run, doing that for years, I get, I guess that somehow that, you know, affected me in the sense that, you know, that wasn't really what I signed for in the beginning. and. Uh, as I say, like even the industry evolved through the years, so it was harder and harder to have like a strong ownership when it comes to to characters for me in a place like Blur. Yeah. And uh, this managing this managing side of like of the work wasn't really too too appealing for me. Right. Yeah. And I've been doing that for years. Um, so I started looking for other opportunities, and uh, Mariah offered me. A good one actually and they asked me only like you know to, to do what I was uh, interested in doing which was only like characters on a limited on a limited universe because of the universe of League of Legends but they have so many characters anyway uh, for me it was somehow um, refreshing you know so you worked on League of Legends at Riot uh, I don't work on the game I work on a, on a basically cinematic division of Riot that basically um, I can't go too much into details because we are still in like, sure. you know, but basically we do like uh, um, shorts bas basically based on like the universe of, uh, of League of Legends. That's our, like one of the main goals, you know what I mean? To provide uh, uh, player content basically, you know. Right, like stories. Yeah, behind stories the related behind the character. There is the game, but then there's like a whole reality of these characters that player, the players are interested. Like who are these players, these, sorry, these like um, champions, these like characters outside of the game. So we try to explore this like, you know, universe through our stories, you know what I mean? Right. But basically uh, it's a cinematic division. So. Yeah the way we operate is pretty much like the same as any other um, animation studios. So we have like, you know, character modelers, concept artists up front, we have like riggers, animators, lighters, uh, people that do uh, compositing and, uh, and so on, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So to me, it hasn't changed too much compared to, to Blur in terms of like um, technicalities, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I have a better schedule for sure because Blur was very tight mm -hmm. and uh, and less variety in terms of uh, 
of uh, you know characters but uh, the core of my job is basically the same you know what i mean my workflow except for some software hasn't changed that much you know what i mean hmm. okay so working at riot games um and you've been there since two or three years ago yeah it's uh i started in uh, i think it was october 2015 something like that okay i'm curious actually with the uh the difference between a game asset and something for a cinematic asset what's is there much of well, a difference I never, nowadays? I never, I never really work on game assets. I mean, except when I was working in, uh, in Italy in that game company. Mm. I can't really speak. I, I mean, I don't really want to have, you know, um, it's not really my experience to do like characters for, uh, for games. Oh, but I'm character- curious, like the, the uh, is there a big difference between like, do they go low poly and then high poly for the Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I okay. mean, this, these are like bas- the basic, the basic like, you know, uh, the basic difference is that characters for games, of course, they need to, to run into a real time engine, you know, so the basic geometry, I mean, you start from a high res sculpting and then you bake those like geometry information on a lower cage, mm. you know, right. uh, a lower cage mesh. So generally speaking, the models that we have in Blur are way higher in like polygon numbers than the game model of any other game. I mean, most games, let's put it this way, you know. And, and the technicalities behind like games are way higher than those compared to, you know, studios like, uh, you know, like Blur or even like, or Cinematic Division. Because in example, um, in games, you have to pack the text like properly, you know, in like, you know, pack the text in like UV sheets, you have to do, memory saving like uh, considerations and stuff like that. We don't really have this kind of like limitation. We didn't really have that in Blur, you know. We are doing like textures of like almost any size, any reasonable size, any number. Um, the organization is totally left to you. And render engines like V-Ray or Arnold, whatever, they completely manage the situations pretty well, you know. So in a way, it was more, uh, I think it's way more like free than like a uh, gaming environment when it comes to the creation of, uh, of characters, you know, a cinematic environment, like right. the one I'm working with. I heard, it, is it true that um, if you're a game artist first, it's harder to get a job doing like offline, you know, like cinematics and things? If you're a gamer? A game artist, uh-huh. because I've heard that the, the level of detail that they work with is much smaller compared to I don't, I don't think I don't think that's it, it might have been like true like a few years ago yeah. but in these modern days a game artist is usually like a, an amazing modeler an amazing like digital sculptor you know what I mean yeah, yeah. and then maybe like when it comes to texturing he might have like different skill sets depending if he works like in a more painterly game or in a more photorealistic games but to be honest like game artists today they are very very solid CG artists, let's put it this way, because they start from like very high res models, you know, maybe a lot of them, they don't use like sophisticated like, uh, you know, shaders, Mm -hmm. like the one that they use like, you know, for uh, VFX productions, but it's something that they can learn. But today in games, I mean, honestly, like the amount of like craft when it comes to artists is totally comparable to people working in the uh, in the VFX industry, totally, you know what I mean? It's a different skill set, a different kind of software that they use, but in terms of like skill set, I don't know. I, I, believe, I mean, I met like so many like game artists these days, they're like way better than a lot of people that I know working in the VFX industry. Right, okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Wow. Because it's the, the industry changed a lot through introduction of like software like ZBrush, they're widely used by, by game artists. Mm. So the assumption that, you know, game artists these days are somehow of a lesser profile compared to like, you know, people working in films, is not that true anymore, you know what I mean? It's a different kind of like skill set in some areas, yeah. but definitely the two, the two things are like converging due to the fact that like game graphics even these days is becoming like increasingly better and better, you know what I mean? Hmm. That makes sense. So the amount of details that game artists deal today, at least in the stage of like uh, high res sculpting, is quite comparable to, to you know, 
the amount of details that, put, that people put in places like Blur. You know what I mean? The difference is that in Blur, usually you don't do the extra step of like baking the high rest information on lower mesh. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you build like as much as like photorealistic shaders as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, usually in a game environment, you're, you're like just like, you know, bounded to whatever engine they give you. But sometimes mm -hmm. the engine is amazing. And the BPR shaders that they use are like great. You know what I mean? Right. Maybe they are not like extremely photorealistic, but game artists are already in the mindset of working with uh, PPR shaders, you know what I mean? Do you pay much attention to the, the rendering engine crazy market? Crazy like, market? Oh, the, the number of renderers that are out yeah, there. Yeah, it's, it's really crazy. Um, <laughs> not really, I mean. What do you use? Well, these days I've been using like uh, V, I went through like, I went through Manta Ray, I went through V-Ray, now I'm using like Arnold because we use Arnold in, uh, in Riot. Right. So basically for my personal stuff, today I use like equally both like V-Ray and, uh, and Arnold, you know right. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, my experience is that they're all amazing. <laughs> right, right. It's not, I mean, the competition is so high today and the features are so like, you know, equivalent in a way that um, I'm not probably like the, the right person to be to talk like specifically sure. what would be the best, you know what I mean? I think it's just a matter of like the software you have been using for years, the, the one that you are comfortable with, if you want to use the GPU or not, you know what I mean? Honestly, today the possibilities of like GPUs with things like Octane or uh, Redshift are like amazing, you know what I mean? Uh, I haven't approached that yet because I have a just like a stupid laptop at home that doesn't like mount great video cards. Um, so my experience with those like GPU uh, renders have been limited, but I can see like an extreme potential, of course, you know what I mean? And probably it's gonna be the future. Yeah. Um, Do you think there are any software in the next five to 10 years, can you foresee any software replacing any jobs in the pipeline? Anyone that should be worried? Well, that's a very interesting question. Like, uh, I've been talking this a lot with my, you know, co-workers, with my character modeling co-workers back in the days, the fact that, uh, you know, just like scanning, you know what I mean? Um, scanning things, like scanning actors, like uh, deprived us somehow of a lot of like uh, artistry when it comes like to sculpting faces and stuff like that. And we can totally envision a future where her job is not gonna be the same as it used to be in terms of like uh, meticulously like sculpting a lot of things. A lot of things is gonna be, even now it's happening, a lot of things get like scanned and then get retopology. So the contribution of a character modeler gets like, hey, assemble all these elements coming from a scan, kind of like nicely, uh, tweak them, polish them, add in some little details, but some realities that are already like that, you know. And then, yeah, I can totally envision like software that like in the future will make the process of at least of like making digital doubles easier and easier and easier. Mm. You know what I mean? When it comes like to stylized stuff, it, still the human contribution is very, it's very present, you know what I mean? But when it comes to humans, and in Blur, an example, we were doing sometimes a lot of like semi-realistic, photorealistic characters. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, you get companies that they give you like amazing job. I really like scan face it with like correct topology. All you have to do is like applying. I mean, it's not, it's not that simple. I mean, there's still a lot of work to do if you want to achieve something extremely photorealistic. But the bulk of the job is already there, you know, compared to the days when you were starting from like, you know, a sphere or like um, even a simple base mesh and you want to match a certain likeness. There is an abyss between that and getting like a scan, you know what I mean? So yeah, software are definitely like exponentially making our job easier. I'm not sure, I mean, at least not in the, the next five years we're gonna be replaced completely. Mm -hmm. But definitely, uh, if you think about like libraries like uh, Megascan, you know, for environments and stuff like that, it's amazing how what you can do in a very short amount of time, which, which such tools, which such like libraries and tools to actually combine these like assets, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And those was simply like unthinkable 
maybe even like five years ago, you had to model these assets or maybe find them on, on TurboSquid, but with limited possibilities of actually arranging them and placing them, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, today is definitely, we are definitely going the direction of like uh, making the process of like creating things like way more and more like automatic in a way, you know what I mean? So I believe that the human contribution in the future will be, at least like for my job, will be much more relevant when it comes like to stylized things or things that are now strictly related to uh, a photorealistic uh, environment, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mostly, you know, either like cartoony stuff or semi-realistic or, you know, whatever is not super close to a digital double, let's put it this way. Yeah, yeah. I saw actually recently um, this tool called Wrap3, have you heard of it? Oh, that's the one that basically, what is the one that creates the topology based on a scan? Yeah. Yeah, I saw it, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, it was like you get a scan, which is horribly noisy and all that stuff, yeah. and then you get a, a, base, a mesh, base mesh. And then you overlap. Yeah, and all you do is pinpoint like where are the eyes, where's the mouth corners, that kind of thing. I haven't used it, but it, it's, pretty, it's pretty impressive. It's yeah. pretty impressive, yeah. For somebody that makes digital doubles, like you said, that's, that job's no longer required. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and consider, and consider the fact that, I mean, there are techniques today that are fairly economic, so you can do your own scans, you know what I mean? Right. It's not like, you know, like 10 years ago that scanning a face was something available only uh, through, like, big company that spent, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on, like, very expensive machines, you know? Mm -hmm. Today is you have, like, portable scanners, and uh, even, like, students, they can get, like, a decent scanned base of like faces with, through like portable scanners and they, if they have the knowledge they can use that you know right uh, yeah to start their work you know what I mean yeah so yeah I mean definitely we are going in that direction you know what I mean how much importance do you put on um, staying ahead of the the new tools like do you oh it's I think it's extremely important sometimes I feel like I feel like a dinosaur because like I mean, I have a workflow. I, f I think I'm decently fast for the things that I do at work. But sometimes I, I, I feel like I'm losing contact sometimes with, uh, with the evolution of the tools that I use. Just take an example like ZBrush. He has so many amazing tools. And sometimes I see techniques that to me, they're just like mind blowing. And uh, just because I lost contact with it, I need to do things at work. So that I don't really have time to explore some function of ZBrush. I don't really have the physical time to actually try them out. And then when I, when I have some, some time, I just look at these tutorials and I'm like, wow, this is, this is like mind blowing. I had no idea you can do this in ZBrush, you know what I mean? Right. So I randomly pick like, you know, pieces of information here and there through like YouTube and whatever, you know. Or if I need to do something specific, I just look online. But it's, I can't really like, like I was back in the day, it was like meticulously every day look for tutorials online because, because I work in a company, I work for production, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So sometimes I probably have the feeling that I do things in a, in a way that is probably like slower than it should be, oh. but, but it's reliable because I, I know it's gonna work, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And then in the back of my head, I have like, you know, a post-it that says, well, just look at that tutorials for like whatever you know <laughs> yeah. right right so it's it's really easy to stay to stay on track on the modern state of like tools today you know what i mean because yeah. there are so many software there are so many like mm. fast releases of uh, um of techniques you know what i mean yeah. let's consider an example uh, i do characters right so um characters sometime sometime a lot of time they have like clothing I always been sculpting clothes, like, you know, by myself, like, you know, looking at references. And then it came out like Marvelous Designer, right? And then at the beginning, I was skeptic because, you know, at the beginning, Marvelous Designer was kind of like, uh, it was not the same software it is today. And it was not that easy as it is today to make like great results. But today, honestly, the result that you can achieve in Marvelous Designer, if you know what you're doing, it's not even comparable to what you can do with sculpting, at least for what we do. The result is so photorealistic, it's so natural, so much that, that for people like me, you better, you better consider seriously that software in your workflow. I mean, you can still sculpt the things. 
you know, the old way in ZBrush, you know, taking references. But first, you spend a lot of time. I mean, you have some, some satisfaction, of course, if it looks good. But hey, there is a software there specifically, specifically for this. And the learning curve maybe is like a little bit like steeper, but in the long run, it's going to help you out. So my knowledge in example of like Marvelous Designer is like, OK, but definitely something that I want to push in the future. I, because I've seen things that honestly like blows my mind, you know what I mean? And that comes to other software as well, you know what I mean? I have, uh, I use like maybe five softwares in total for my, um, for my job. But I can't say that each one of those I have like 100% like deep knowledge, you know what I mean? I have a fairly good knowledge of each software, specifically for my workflow, you know what I mean? But I don't think it's realistic that you deeply learn each software um, just because like simply there is no time, at least like for people like me that work, work in the industry, you know what I mean? Right. So most of the time you just like learn the software for the things that you need to do. Yeah. yeah. Mm. What do you say to artists, because I've had this a lot, like, uh, like I realized the other day, there's really no point today learning to model a tree, for example. Because speed tree is the industry standard, and that's if you need to create a custom tree. And if you just need a normal tree that everybody has in the background, you just purchase one off Turbo Squid or whatever. There's almost there, there's some jobs where uh, learning to do something by hand um, is almost irrelevant. I think well, I think it's irrelevant for people that work. In a, I mean, let's put it this way. If, you, if you're working in the industry on a specific project yeah. and you are in charge of like doing an environment, you don't want to model a tree. You probably want to rely on a library. Yeah. You want to speed up the process. You have a very limited of time. You have to see the big picture. And yes, that's like, it's wise to go online and buy, and buy a tree because you don't want to spend time on that. You know? If you're a student, that's another matter. If you never approach like any sort of like modeling, you probably want to go through the process of like modeling a tree, even if, if it's your like personal project. Right. You know, I mean, maybe modeling one tree one time is going to give you like something in terms of like insight, in terms of like eye sensibility for like forms and everything. You know what I mean? So it really depends on the context of where you place yourself in the in the industry. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's true. For students, so that's definitely. that's that's the context. You know what I mean? Yeah. Definitely, if you are a production artist, you don't want to go through the process of like doing a tree unless it's a very like specific tree, like a magical <laughs> tree based on a given concept and need to have like a specific form. There's no, there's no way to go around it. You have to model it. That's right. If it's just a generic tree, part of like a forest, whatever, yeah. no, there's no point. There's no care. Thanks God we have libraries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks God we have libraries for that, you know. Yeah. Because it was tedious. That's probably one days, job you know? which is which has been replaced in a way, is modeling just basic stuff that's in the background. Like back in the day, you said you made that you had to model everything, yeah. but now it's like Turbo Squid. Yeah, like Mega Scan, like whatever you know. Yeah. Or then after a while, you build your own libraries. Each studio has have their own libraries. You know? I'm curious about that. Like, so if you yeah, you recycle a lot, of course. You know. But what it, it does the studio? So if you make a commercial for a company and you make some assets, can you reuse those assets in the next project, or do they own the rights? Well, it depends how specific they are. You know, okay. how recognizable, how branded they are. I mean, of course, you can't like. You know, if you use a digital double in one project, right. you can't really use the same digital double to another because, like, it's the face of somebody, it's the face of an actor. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there are like specific NDAs that don't allow you to do that. But if it's something generic, like a prop, like you know, uh, whatever, like a door, like a generic door, like an object, like a table, yes, of course, like of course you can reuse that. You know, as long as they're not like specifically branded studios, like reuse assets all the time you know it's just just common sense you know right I mean? yeah makes sense unless unless they have like some specific like contract with the client so that like whatever assets they build for them it can be used anywhere i frankly don't know i mean it's not my you know it's not my branch but what i can tell you is that from my previous experiences in working with studios they tend to recycle as much as possible in order to 
save speed time. up to save, to save time because the time that we have is very limited, you know what I mean? Yeah. So if you already have like a, a textured hand, you're gonna use it the same hand that you use in the project to another. It's, it's a no-brainer. Nobody wants to remodel a hand unless it's a hero hand and it's gonna be like this close to the camera, you know? Right, exactly, yeah. Um, if it's just a hand of a generic character, who cares? Somebody did like a texturing job for me already, I'm gonna reuse it. It happens all the time, it happens all the time. Yeah. Sometimes you start from an asset as a base and then you tweak it. Yeah. Super common as well, you know what I mean? Yeah. Leather jacket, take it from another project and tweak it and you know, change the shaders, uh, make it specific for another project. But it saves you so much time to have like the base geometry already done that it's like, a no-brainer is like invaluable, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah. Do you? Um, I was going to ask about the mindset of what what you think separates the the great artists, like the superstars, from the people that struggle to find work. Is there anything you can think of a character trait or uh, anything that? can contribute to someone's success? <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't know, like, to get, talking about superstars for me is just funny, like, in, in an industry where, I mean, even if you work, like, as a professional in the industry, it's like the status of, like, superstars, I, I know what you're talking about, it comes from, like, online recognition and social media amount of likes, I guess. I just mean but at the core, I mean, they're just, like, they're just like professionals, you know what I mean? Right. And whoever has, like, an attitude of, like, you know, taking themselves like too seriously, to me, just like laughable. So, <laughs> I don't know. Um, let's say these people, let's say, let's talk about like professionals that work like, you know, consistently in production and Yeah, prolific students. artists, yeah. And uh, the, the main difference is that the professionals have metabolized a lot of like uh, methodologies and processes that probably a student is completely unaware of. Okay. So the student is exposed to a world which is the world of like social media and YouTube which is not really like the reality of, uh, of our industry. So sometimes they're like concerned about things like topology and like hey is my, is my mesh enough good for like animation and all they have to do is like making a character maybe you know what I mean. So there is a lot of like confusion sometimes in these people in the students and what they don't really know or get is that the only thing they have to do is to make like pretty good looking pictures most of the time, you know what I mean? And then all the technicalities behind, they are so specific to the kind of like environment where they're gonna go work with, that is totally secondary. So most people that get hired in a company is because they have an amazing portfolio, you know what I mean? And sometimes, yes, they have like decent idea in terms of like topology and technicalities behind, but that's, that's not most of the time that the first thing that the recruiters look at, at least like for my job, when it comes like to character modeling. For a rigor and animators, I can't talk. But for my job, most of the time, people look at like, let's put it this way, pretty images. Characters need to look good. What's behind the hood, like topology and the way you did it, is fairly secondary. It's fairly secondary, you know what I mean? Unless maybe you work for you want to work for games. In that case, like maybe they're going to look at the you know the low poly cage and stuff like that, and the way you pack textures. But for my job, I've seen like so many situations where people got like freelance gigs in very like prestigious studios like Blur, based only on like images that they that they made. You know what I mean? I, and images by images, I mean like character sheets or like character renders or like you know key shots sort of like style illustration and stuff like that that was enough right. to get it to get a, to get like a, an entrance in this kind of like industry or to get like a job or to get like a freelance gig you know what i mean um so the mindset is basically for what i can see of a lot of like misconceptions a lot of like people feeling like overwhelmed by the huge amount of information that is available today because everything is really available online if you want to dig. It's really hard sometimes to actually uh, pick up the really great stuff from the things that are, you know, 
maybe somehow valuable in terms of like uh, learning process, but not that fundamental, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the inflation of, of information make like students sometimes like confused and like stalling on like, hey, what's the next step? Um, what do you think my, I mean, what do you think I should do? What should I do on my character? And I'm like, wow, there are so many renders online. What do you think you should do? I mean, what do you think you should fix? You already have a bar outside online on amazing like works already done. So your problem might be like technical. So be specific when it comes to that. But most people are just like genetic because they don't know how to formulate what they should do in terms of like next step. Because there are way too many information, I believe, mm. these days. So it's really hard to pick up like whatever is valuable, you know. Mm. But at the same time. There are like schools, there are like YouTube tutorials, online courses, you know. And wh where do you choose? I, I'm, a, I'm a still believer, I'm a firm believer that it's still possible to learn a lot of things by yourself these days. If you have the will, the time and the passion, you know what I mean? But you really have to, to have fun when it comes to these kind of things. And if you have fun, you, you can go through the process of like trying and retrying, you know, without asking people, you know what I mean? Because it's fun, you know, it's your, it's your passion, it's your drive, it's your hobby, you know what I mean? But if you stall and you feel like stuck because you can't find things online, that's already like, uh, in a way, like a failing attitude to me, you know what I mean? You should try to do things like the best you can and then like move on to the next project or yeah of course like you can confront with people but you can't really feel like feel stuck because there is so much things online the information is just there and then it's up to you to 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 do it you know what i mean sometimes sometimes i feel in, i feel in the situation that i'm like even in my daily job i'm like oh my god i don't know how exactly to do this thing in a fast way so when I, when I like finish all the possible like option, I'm like, I have to brute force it. Brute force it mean like maybe like spending four hours doing some stupid shit. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Some very stupid task. You have to brute force it. But that's the only way to get it done. I need to get it done because somebody is like tapping on my shoulder like, hey, are you done? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. My, my attitude was the same even before. It was like, if I don't know how to do it, I'll do it the best of my possibilities. Yeah. But there's no way I'm going to like stop and stall and ask for feedbacks and if I don't get the feedbacks I'm not going to finish my character you know what I mean right. I see a lot of com incomplete stuff in example from uh, students or people that approach like uh, computer graphic in general they show me stuff and it's clearly incomplete on a lot of levels and they wait for feedbacks you know what I mean mm -hmm. and that's to me is like you know it's 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 uncomfortable to give feedback on something that that's true you know what i mean i know what you mean at least like if you if you show me something that is not looking great at least like you say hey this is finished what do you think to me it's way better than saying like how should i what, what i should do next you know mm -hmm. what how should i model the belt uh should i like you know sculpt the sculpt like the boots should i sculpt the pants like Yes, yes, you should, of course you should, but why do you do it before, like, asking me? Why are you asking me, you know what I mean? You have, like, so many references online already, so many examples. You already have in your mind the quality bar. You don't need validation for somebody, like, working in the industry. I feel there is some sort of, like, inertia or, like, laziness, in a way, based on the fact that maybe with, with the modern society and social media, everything is, like, reachable easily like through a click or like you go on YouTube, you find a video, you know what I mean? So people expect to find like resources like pretty fast, you know, and if they can find it in like one or two clicks, they just like, okay, let me ask somebody, you know what I mean? Sometimes just like spend your time, like dig it or like maybe make a shitty work and move on, but just put it there as like, you know, uh, as an experience somehow, you know what I mean? It goes like through, Yes, it's part of your learning process, even to make mistakes, you know what I mean? Yeah, right. It's not like that granted that you need to to make like a great thing in a very fast like turnaround. Time it takes like a lot of time, you know what I mean? Right, yeah. And the answer doesn't necessarily like need to come like right away. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. You have to go through, through, through this like learning process of like doing and redoing things by yourself, you know what I mean?
So you think that's important, the, the experimentation, even if it's the wrong method? Totally, totally. I, I'm a firm believer that it's better to do something in a shitty way than not, than not doing anything, like waiting for, you know, the right moment or the right technique or like, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. To me, it's like, it happened to me so many times that I modeled things and then looking at those like a few months later, a few months after, I was like, well, I should have done it the other way. Well, that's good. Next time you're going to do it like the proper way, you know what I mean? Yeah, right. But at the time, you know, I was right to do it that way because they w I need to do it that way in a certain amount of time. I wanted to get the job done, especially, you know what I mean? I wanted to achieve that in my portfolio. That was important at the time, you know what I mean? I could have stalled at the time, you know, waiting for inspiration, references, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm a firm believer of like brute forcing things sometime, or let's say like doing the things the best you can with the given tools, it's better than, than just like not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And a finished work is always better than a work in progress mm -hmm. all the time. I've seen so many portfolios and I, I don't know, I have like an immediate rejection when I see something that is labeled as like work in progress. And to me it's like, why are you even showing this? I mean, you're showing this like to people that are supposed to, to hire you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So they're gonna evaluate you for most people are going to evaluate you not for your potential but for what you can give you know what i mean so i can't really i mean i can see sometimes that you have some potential but i want to see what you can do like you know as an artist right now at the full spectrum of your capabilities you know what i mean so that's why i encourage like most of the time when it comes to portfolio to show only like final stuff whatever final means for you you know what i mean yeah I'm curious about your thoughts on, because um, you were mentioning before, uh, you know, working to completion for a piece of artwork. Um, I think there's also some value in uh, calling something finished and moving on to the next one. When, what, when do you call something finished? Because there's a certain point, like if somebody was very new to characters, for example, I wouldn't suggest them to work like three months on like one character. Why not? Yeah? <laughs> I mean, if, you, if it's your hobby okay. and nobody's like giving you any deadline, hmm. just push it as much as you want. I mean, okay. like, why not? I mean, what do you have to lose? It's your hobby, supposedly supposed to be fun for you. Mm -hmm. So polish it as much as you want. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do if I work on a, on a personal project. Of course, like even, of course, like today, my approach to personal project is, uh, is somehow like affected by the fact that I have a working methodology uh, based on my years of experience in the industry, you know what I mean? So I know how to, to cut corners and stuff like that, much more than back in the days. But still, for my personal project, I take all the time in the world that I want, you know what I mean? But when it comes to my professional job, no, usually I have a limited schedule. So my recommendation when it comes like to personal work or for pieces that you want to put in your portfolio, just take the time. I mean, unless you have like some, I don't know, some deadline of some reason because you have to submit your portfolio within a certain time. I mean, just take your time, polish it, put love in what you do, you know what I mean? Every single bit of like enhancement to me is totally worth it. You know what I mean? I mean, I can think about, if you want to add like pitch files on a realistic character, take the time to do it. If you think that it's gonna add it, like 0.5% of like beauty to your job, Can why you not? Show? Why don't you try doing it? Yeah. Some time people don't do this kind of things out of like laziness because it can be a tedious process and because maybe they think, no, it's not gonna add that much. Well, my question is like, did you try before? Maybe, maybe it's gonna give that like 5% more of like realism that you need or like spend your time on shaders. Why did you, why don't you spend like time to actually nail a certain like skin shaders or metal shaders? Why don't you put like lovely scratches on a clean metal surface? You know what I mean? Yeah, you should definitely put the time to do these kind of things because it makes a huge difference. When you sum all these elements together, 
the difference between like one month work and two months work is probably substantial. It's a lot, yeah. If you if you spend time on it, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so to me, the question like, why should I spend three months on a character is like, well, what do you also have to do? I mean, if you have like, I mean, if you have if you have a side job, maybe sure. But if it's your hobby, yeah, yeah. Don't you like doing it? Yeah, What's yeah. the problem like spending three three months of time? I mean, what makes you think that three months of time is a lot? Is a lot of time compared to what? Mm. I mean, sometimes people like sp spend three months of time working on a character for like films. You know what I mean? Mm. Can't you do it like on your on your own mm. with your limited amount of like knowledge? Yeah. Depends. It depends what you do in those three months. You know what yeah. I mean? Depends what you do, what you add, or. I mean, time when it comes to these things is, is very, it's very relative to me, you know. I know people that they can do amazing job in a very short amount of time. Some people can do the same amazing job in a longer time. Time is really like, you know, a factor that goes in, unfortunately, when you have a schedule, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When you have like money into the equation, yes, you have time associated. But I will take, honestly take all the time in the world to do something that I like if I don't have like any, any restriction like, you know, somebody paying me or whatever. I do, I work on it when I want. As long as it's fun, I don't care spending like weeks or months on it. You mm. know? I think it is part of the, re the recruitment process though. Like they want to know how long something took to create. Really? Oh man, I don't know. I don't know what kind of like recruiters these are. Right. Any, any, and if that's really a requirement, mm. I wouldn't be comfortable. I, would per I wouldn't personally like that kind of like company mm. because like to me, it's all about the art first. And then like, hey, unless it took you like one year, but if it looks amazing, I wanna know why you spend one year on this. To me, it's all always about the art. I know people that are very fast, but they kind of like the, the, the work that they do is not even like close, the kind of things that they well, we want. An example, Blur, I never ask anybody how long it took to them to achieve something in their portfolio. Mm. They were just assuming, you know what, we don't really care how long it took you. This is the time that we give you when you come here. And you're going to make it work, trust me. If it doesn't work, it's not going to work for you. But in the beginning, asking how long it takes to me is so like, I don't know. There are Unimportant, right. I mean, what if it took him like, Six years, six, six, sorry, <laughs> three months, but it maybe you work only one week each month, you know what I mean? Oh, sure. It's so, it's so like, um, you know, um, unspecific mm -hmm. in terms of like quantifying mm -hmm. what goes in the mind of somebody that works in 3D, yeah. saying how long it took, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because three months of my modeling probably would produce like, a huge amount of like detail compared like of three months of another guy, you know what I mean? Right. So it's, it's not really interesting as a data to ask how long it took to do this, you know what I mean? Mm. To me, it's always about like, this looks great. Okay, can you do this for us? You know what I mean? And then I'm gonna tell you how long it's gonna take. Mm. If you can make it in that time, that's great. If it's not, it's not gonna work. Yeah, but usually yeah. when people is confronted with time, they're going to make it work. They're going to make it work. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So even if it took you like one month and somebody asks you, hey, you have to do it in 10 days. Well, you know, you're going to cut corners. You're going to like do overtime. And it's a reality of this industry. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, to me, coming from my recruiter asking you how long it's going to take you, especially if it's your like, I don't know, your first job, it's a very unfair kind of really? like, yeah, I think so. Isn't I'm that sorry. something Noman teaches, like part of their... Uh, Noman? Noman. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, honestly. Oh, okay, but yeah. Mm. I, I don't know, I mean, of course there is a value in making things fast, but they need to look good, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. If they don't look good, I, I don't really care like mm. how, long, how long it took, you know what I mean? Mm. To me, I, I never really ask like how long it took to people to do it. I just, just so irrelevant to me, yeah. you know. Yeah. When I see something amazing that like catch my attention online, it's the last of my thought to think about how long it took, you know what I mean? Yeah. Really, like um, people adapt easily, you know. 
But the artistic skills, those are really hard to find, generally speaking, you know what I mean? So the time factor associated to that, to me, is really, is really relative, you know what I mean? Especially considering that it, it's kind of like tough industry sometimes, you know? So starting from the beginning with the idea that, you know, your work is so related to a certain amount of time to get done, it's very discouraging in a way, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. especially, especially when you're a student, you know what I mean? That you already sure. start with the mindset that time, time is in the equation, you know? And I never, never ever had that in the back of my head. To me, it was fun to do these things. Yeah. And the more you do them, the more you get faster, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But if I had known since the beginning that what I was doing, it had to be done in like maybe half day and I was taking months, Probably I would have been discouraged, you know what I mean? Hmm. I would have felt like, oh man, I suck. Yeah. No, that's not the point. I yeah. was doing good stuff for the time and I was taking all the time in the world because I was doing that for fun, you know, my little room, with my little computer, with my stupid hardware, you know what I mean? Hmm. So I would strongly discourage like people to be concerned about how long it takes, you know, to do what they do, you know what I mean? To me, it's like, hey, nail something first. Now, you can think about how long it took you, but trust me, next project is gonna be faster, and next one, even faster, you know what I mean? It should be, yes, that's important. Um, yeah. That it gets, it gets faster. Yeah, because I, I guess the thing that the students are sometimes unaware of and why it's asked as, as recruitment is like, yeah, if you wanna get a job and, uh, and then the first gig is like, make this character, and then they go, they're gonna right, give you. They're gonna give you a certain I amount need, of uh, time. I need six months to do it. And they're like, you've got three days. They don't want to hire you. Um. Well, I don't know. I mean, honestly, like six months, they could be. It could be like a fairly unrealistic mm. amount of time. You know yeah. what I mean? Because like a lot of things happen in six months. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but all I'm saying is that students shouldn't be in the mindset of like being fast in what they do, you know what I mean? Especially when it comes to the things that I do, which is like production yeah. models. They should be in the mindset of like, hey, you have to nail certain artistic like goals, you know what I mean? So quality comes first. Then let's try to cut corners after. But first I want to see something good. Sure. So take your time, take a reasonable amount of time, because if you take one year, make a character, maybe like, you yeah, have been lazy, let's put it this way. But if you work like consistently every day, probably like, sh it should take like longer than I do, but as long as it looks good, we're fine, yeah. you know? Yeah. So talking of... Uh, it's the same thing like uh, people super concerned about topology and stuff like that, you know? Like, oh, when, you, when you're gonna do the, the right topology on this character, I'm like, Dude, I first, when I hear the word red topology, I want to puke. Because like, I so hate it to do re the red topology. So even when a student tells me, when are you gonna do the red topology, it makes me like itching. It's something that I hate doing. I really don't care what's going on under the hood. I never did. This is something that is necessary to make things work in the pipeline, right? But for the kind of job that I do, I get so scrutinized when it comes like to artistic stuff first. And that's my main concern. So when a student that clearly never really achieved any sort of like artistic like greatness in their job asks me about the technical things like that, to me it feels like this shouldn't be your first priority. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Same as the time. Same as like, oh man, like took me like 15 days. I mean, do you think I'm f fast enough? Like, dude, the problem that you have is that it's not looking great. This is the main problem. It's not that it took you like Right, yeah. This is the main problem that you have to work on. Yeah, yeah. Same as topology. What's under the hood in the wireframe is not as important for people like me as the fact that what I see in render looks good. Then we can work on the topology after. Sure. We can work on that after. Yeah. Topology also like is very relative because it's like strictly depending on the studio where you work for, you know, um, methodologies, pipelines, software, whatever. I mean, there are like some common sense like rules, but generally speaking, I've seen things like in Blur in terms of like topology, 
They're like so crazy in terms of like people that are like purists when it comes to that, you know what I mean? I, you know, back in the days, like triangles were the enemy, you know. I've seen so many triangles in deformation areas in, in blur, uh, you know, that <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. But that's the reality of the industry. We don't care that much about these things as people, people might think, you know what I mean? And that comes from the fact that, you know, there are a lot of like online courses and schools that they really push on these aspects, and they're right to do so. But maybe the importance of these elements should be secondary compared to, you know, um, achieving a certain kind of like artistic skill first. Mm. So craft comes first, and then like technicalities, in my opinion at least, come after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. We've only got uh, about 10 minutes left, but right. I wanted to ask quickly, what would you say if you had to train somebody up to be hireable as a character artist and they were a beginner, they want to work at Blur one day, they want to be a character artist and you had to train them and you only had one year to do it. One year? One year. What would the training regime look like? The training regime, oh my god. What would you start with? And these people never touch a 3D application? Before? Let's say they got the basics. They know basics. They got the basics. Yeah. Okay, well, well you need you need a starting point, which are, I mean, sample steals of like blur characters are widely available online these days. A lot okay. of people have them in their portfolio, people like me or like previous employee of blur. So that should be the bar, first of all. Okay. Like the render quality should be the bar. And that's value for anybody who wants to work at blur. Hey, look at the people that work in the past at blur or they're working now, look at their portfolio, look at the, the quality of their character. That's what you need to achieve in the first place, you know mm. what I mean? And then when it comes to the training, it really depends on the starting level of this person, you know. I would definitely start with like, hey, let's take a concept and you need to match this concept. So you don't make a character out of your head. I'm gonna give you a concept of a character taken from like whatever reference, like comics or movies or like, you know. Why is that important? Because that's what I do. Oh, I as, match, as I, a job, right. Yeah, as for my job, that's what I do. I match somebody else's concept or maybe like there's a specific version of Batman coming from like uh, whatever like comic issue and I want to match that specific version of Batman. So I will tell to this person, hey, this is the goal, is to match this Batman in this style with this time, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I would just like observe the process and go through that. And whenever, like, you know, I will tell him what I would do if I were him, you know, start with, like, blocking out, nailing the proportion, taking the concept, like, you know, putting side by side with your render, fixing the proportion, proportion comes first all the time. Yeah. Basically steps like this, you know what I mean? The detailing always comes later, you know, at the very end, I mean, at the very end, after, after the proportions are, are nailed, it's basically the same thing I would do if I would have to do it in, uh, in production, you know. And I will do a lot of paint overs, for sure. So whenever he is ready to provide me something in terms of like visual, I will do a paint over based on, you know, looking at the actual concept reference. What do you mean? Paint, so you would get the paint concept? Paint over, I will take his render, I will just oh, Photoshop, I will do a paint over based on the, uh, trying to match the concept, you know okay. what I mean? Okay. I will change like maybe the silhouette. I will change maybe like some forms. I will play with like the positioning of some elements in order to match the concept. You know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah. the concept is like, the, you know, is the main point of reference. Mm -hmm. The concept sometimes it can be like loose, but most of the time there are elements like silhouettes, proportion, um, mutual, um, mutual, relationship between the ratio of some elements that needs to be conserved in your renders, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right. And the only way to make people understand what they need to do is to do a paint over. Because you can explain them and say, hey, can you make like the eyes like less round or like more narrow, blah, blah, blah. You can say that with words, right? But your idea of like narrower eyes is probably different than my idea. So the only way 
to talk to artists is to actually show them, show that, you know what I mean? To make a paint over, that's what I'm saying. Mm. I've seen so many like people that even like supervisor that through the years, they're like, oh, can you make like this metal less reflective or oh, can you make like the shoulders like bigger or like the hands like smaller? In my experience, when I, when I ever had like to, to be a lead artist or actually to direct people, yeah, sometimes I say that, but most of the time I take the renders and I tweak it in Photoshop to show them. Because we are all artists, we like speak visually. So if I want, to, if I want something specific, I better like show you what it means, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if I want something like less blue or less red, You'll demonstrate. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate in Photoshop and show you what that means. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of like specificity that we do in our, in our job, in example, you know what I mean? It's, it's the only way to guide somebody to, to train their eye sensibility to things. And at the end of the process, believe me, when you see like your first render and your final render going through, the, through all the process of these like paint overs, you'll be shocked about how much, how much you have improved and how much you couldn't see at the beginning. I remember I was working on this project it was a Simpson, Simpsons ride, okay. and I had to model this like, it was a whale for the Simpsons universe. It was like a very cartoony whale, and I was still freelancing in Italy. So this supervisor at Blur, Dan Rice, was in charge of the process, of the project. So I did this like whale very fast. In like five days, I modeled it, sent some renders to Blur through email. He looked at it and he was like, dude, you're not even close. <laughs> it was shocking to me. It was brutal because I was coming already for like, from like months of freelancing for Blur on way more like sophisticated characters, characters with like sci-fi helmets, like, you know, gears, and blah, blah, blah. I was like, this is just, what do you mean it's not even close? It's just a stupid whale. So what he did was to take the renders overlapping on my renders and then I was like, oh, okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, I mean, like, the line is not exactly, the silhouette is not exactly the same. But that was making such a huge difference. And my mindset at the time was like, well, it's close enough to the concept. This is a whale, this is a whale in the so concept. So you put the concept on top of yeah. the render, okay. In Blur, they probably still do that all the time. And I, that's what I would do even now, if I have to evaluate somebody that asks me, does it look like the concept? I don't know. Let's see. Let's put it on top and see what's the difference. Right. It's the only way. I mean, you can, you can be good enough with your eyes to be like, move this up and down. But that's but the very, very valuable things to do is to actually overlap them and align things. You know what I mean? So move the gear, I mean, move the belt up, down, shorten the legs, whatever else to me, needs to be done. You know what I mean? And what, then what did, what did when, you I say after? In, when I got into... Well, I was shocked. I was like, I was like, do you really want me to follow the silhouette and most like tracing the concept? It was like, yeah, what are you thinking? I was like, oh, okay. And it wasn't easy at all because at the time there was no ZBrush. We had to do that through poly modeling. Yeah. And I was like, are you as really asking me to match the silhouette one to one? Mm. And he was like, yeah, I go, why not? I was like, okay. It was so important because especially when the lines are few for stylized characters, you know, a difference, a minimal difference in silhouette can make a huge impact in terms of like um, how you're going to recognize and like the character. If you think about like Homer Simpson or any like Simpson characters, are literally like a bunch of like very few lines, you know what I mean? But every line has a specific purpose in a specific place and specific ratios are there, you know what I mean? So if you don't nail it in 3D, it's not going to work. It's, gonna, it's not going to be likable. Sometimes there are problems due to the fact that the 2D concept is not that easily translatable into 3D. Still, you can make a lot of effort to at least match one of those views. Then when you start rotating the model, you can be like, OK, we need to do some compromise at this point. But first, you need to do at least like the effort to match as much as possible the concept in one of the views in terms of like silhouette, you know what I mean? That's what, what I would recommend to anybody. And that will definitely be part of my training. It might be like maybe too, too Nazi, too like, you know, too strict, but I'm a firm believer that you have to go through that. When you go through that, you will understand that 
I mean, concepts are really important. There are like people that spend like months trying to figure out this design. So you can't really take them for like, whatever. They're just like an indication. You know what I mean? No, sometimes they are not an indication. They are very specific and they, that's exactly the feeling, the vibe, the gesture that the director, supervisor want to see in 3D, you know? Yeah, and right. So it's really better for you to actually try to follow them as much as possible, you know? Yeah. And then when you get into this mindset, you're gonna achieve like a sensibility when it comes like to forms and shapes that is really oriented toward like, you know, main forms first, details come after, you know? Because a lot of people, especially because of the nature of some software, they tend to, to put a lot of details since the beginning, just because the software allows you to do it pretty easily. Think about ZBrush. Maybe, maybe you model like some not very realistic looking pants, and then in like two seconds, you go to Noisemaker, you make this amazing like denim pattern that goes all the way up, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Things like, well, it's pointless to have a denim pattern if you don't nail the main form first, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's the 90% of the job. Then the detail is like, whatever. Right. You're gonna spend way less time on this, you know what I mean? Yeah. But first you have to go through like blocking stage, nail the proportion, nail the ratio between like the elements, and then we move on. Yeah. Until we achieve that, you're not gonna move on. Yeah. Then we can stay maybe like a lot of time on the early process, but then you have like a solid foundation for everything that follows after, you know what right. I mean? Yeah. Imagine like characters like, uh, like a knight or like a soldier with like overlapping armor. You start like modeling like things on top, but if the proportion below are wrong, then it becomes like a problem right in the process when you have like a bunch of things on top, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's just like, let's nail the proportion first and then we build armor on top on a solid foundation, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that would be my, you know, my regimen in this like, <laughs> In the, a, year, a year is a lot of time. A year, somebody that never done anything like that, maybe would lead to two or three characters, probably, you know? Yeah. But maybe, yeah. So getting the form right, copy the concept, and then do details. Yeah. And at the end, like, when you have a render, you, com you compare it to, like, to the 2D concept, yeah. and they need to match, at least in terms of, like, gesture, silhouette, you know? And then you have all the, you know, all the embellishment of like 3D renders and surface detailing and uh, realistic shaders, you know what I mean? Yeah. But the essence of the concept needs to be, needs to be there. Yeah, yeah. I will be very intransigent, intransigent about it. Intransigent. You'll be what? Very intransigent about it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, got it. <laughs> cool. All right, well, we have got to fly off, but... Uh, Thank you for your time. Appreciate thanks for, it. Thanks for the interview. Thank no you. Worries.